Next on Currents News, Pope Francis changes church teaching on the death penalty. The punishment is being fully rejected. The latest details from the Vatican are next. New York's bravest are remembered in a Brooklyn church on the anniversary of a dark day in fire department history. A new study finds American belief in God is strong, but church attendance is down. We'll dig into the numbers. Plus, I'll have the story of a fire chief's new grandkids. Three are born all on the same day. The news starts right now. Good evening, everyone. I'm Liz Faubles. Pope Francis is changing Catholic teaching on the death penalty. The Holy Father issued an outright ban against capital punishment this morning and ordered a rewrite of the catechism. Delia Gallagher reports the latest from outside St. Peter's Basilica. The Vatican's change in teaching on the death penalty has been some time coming. Both John Paul II and Benedict XVI spoke out against the death penalty, but Pope Francis has officially changed it on the books. I just spoke to Vatican spokesman Greg Burke, who explained why. The key point here is really human dignity. The Pope is saying that no matter how grievous the crime, someone never loses his or her human dignity. Pope Francis has also supported eliminating the death penalty because of the possibility of error in the judicial systems. One of the rationales for the death penalty in Catholic teaching historically was to protect society. Obviously, the state still has that obligation. That's not being taken away here. But they can do that in other ways. While in the United States, the death penalty is still legal, almost all countries in Europe have abolished it. Indeed, eliminating capital punishment is a precondition for entrance into the European Union. Of course, the Pope's decree is not binding on any country, but it is a sign that support for capital punishment is becoming less and less acceptable. Delia Gallagher, Rome. Brooklyn's Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio is voicing strong support for the Pope's decision. He's posted a statement on his Facebook page that says, in part, I commend Pope Francis for his clarification on Catholic Church teaching on the death penalty, declaring it inadmissible in all cases. The death penalty is an act of revenge. Capital punishment destroys the sanctity of life and diminishes us as a society. The Holy Father has called the death penalty an inhumane measure. Crux Rome Bureau Chief Inez San Martin joins us to dig into how the Pope reached this decision. Inez, as always, thank you for being with us. How did this change even come about? Well, this change, at least, was previewed to us in the end of last year when Pope Francis, when he was given a speech on the 20th anniversary of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, very specifically said that he wanted this change to happen. This is a development in doctrine that's been in place for the past 25 years. And what we saw today is the announcement of that decision made by the Pope a long time ago. Now, the Pope is vowing to work for the, uh, to abolish capital punishment wherever it exists in the world. Now, that's a tall order. Are there concrete plans to do that yet? Not as of right now, Liz, but it's safe to say with a person like Pope Francis, I'm pretty sure we're going to be seeing something uh, on this angle pretty soon. We saw him uh, getting very invested on the climate change efforts during the Paris summit in 2015 with Laudato to seek his document on the environment. I'm sure we're going to be seeing some efforts on the Vatican side to make sure that the death penalty is in fact abolished. Now, we want to put this into even broader context, Inez. Francis is changing the death penalty position that St. John Paul established, namely that capital punishment would be permitted in rare cases to protect innocent life. Could the Holy Father face opposition within the church to this major change in Catholic teaching? It's possible that he will. He today faces oppositions from different um, on different issues. What is worth noting, perhaps, Liz, is that this is a development in doctrine that began with John Paul II himself when he wrote in his document, Evangelium Vitae, mm -hmm. that there was a um, praising, a growing opposition to the death penalty. This is something John Paul II um, took as possible in very rare occasions, but it was mostly related not to what the, the Catholic Church teaches, but what society was doing to deal and to confront criminals. By that, what I mean is today there's a guarantee that a person who commits a crime is no longer a danger to society. Then in that case, what does what's the gain 
um, you know, there's a better chance for that person to save himself mm -hmm. if he's given the time to do so. In the U.S., recent polls are showing there's increasing support for capital punishment. So does today's news pose a dilemma for Catholic politicians going forward? It most definitely does. So at least, again, it has to be taken into consideration that this is a development in doctrine. This is something we were waiting for, but it's not completely out of the blue. Um, most close observers from Pope Francis would tell you this is not something unexpected. Did we expect for this to happen today, for this news to be released today? We definitely did not. But we knew it was coming, and this is, again, something the Pope have been preaching about for the past 30 years. When these changes do happen, Inez, where do we go from here? When are we actually going to see these changes manifest in any particular doctrine, in any particular document? Well, well, we need to. What happened today was a change in what is known as the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. This is a huge document released by John Paul II. What we're going to see is this document being updated. Of course, millions of people have the document already in their homes. They bought it when it came out 25 years ago. They bought it in 1997 when it was uh, John Paul II himself asked for some changes on the death penalty to be included to the original document. Um, what we're going to see is this document now being reprinted to, uh, first of all, manifest these changes, but we're also going to be seeing this online. The Vatican website hadn't updated it uh, this, as of this morning, but I'm very sure they're going to be doing that soon. All right, Inez, thank you as always for that insight and perspective. I really appreciate it. Love talking to you. Thank you, Liz. Brooklyn Catholics today honored New York's bravest on the anniversary of a dark day in fire department history. At St. Brendan's Church, the heroes of the Wallbounds Fire were remembered this morning. On August 2nd, 40 years ago, the roof of the supermarket in Sheepshead Bay gave way and six firefighters died. Nearly three dozen more were injured in one of the worst disasters in the department's history. Family members attended today's mass. This is a very sad day for all of us, but I like that we all gather here together at this, at this church to um, honor their lives and, and carry on their legacy to this day. That legacy brought Patrick and his wife Caroline together after they both lost their fathers on that horrible day 40 years ago. They are now married and have a family of their own. More tonight on the miracle of that Mexican plane crash where more than 100 people survived. A priest from Chicago was on board. Leila Santiago hears from him along with other passengers and has video of the moments just before and after that crash. Seconds after takeoff, impact, screams, and panic as passengers shifted into survival mode to escape the flames and the smoke of the fallen plane in Durango, Mexico. All 103 people aboard Aeromexico Flight 2431 survived. I've always been the type of person to say, never take your life for granted, life goes by too fast. But I'd never, I'd never had a reason to say it until now. Ashley Garcia was the one to capture it all on her cell phone. She was one of at least 65 U.S. citizens on board. Garcia lives in Chicago and decided to get video of the plane taking off after noting the rain and the clouds coming her way. We were not even in the air for like five seconds when the wind just pushed us right back down and we kind of were just bouncing up and hitting each other. And then as soon as the plane, the, one of the wings hit the ground, that's when it caught on fire. It was basically just a mad dash for the door as people were uh, trying to escape. Al Herrero, a passenger who also lives in Chicago, immediately turned to those who needed help getting out, including the elderly. My injuries were very, very small compared to others with broken hands and, and broken noses. There was a lot of blood everywhere. So, yeah, I'm very fortunate. Once off the plane, he says he joined a priest who was on board in prayer, Father Ezequiel Sanchez, director of the Shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe in Chicago. Just hours before surgery for his injured arm, he was still counting blessings and giving thanks. The idea that nobody died, he says. But I would consider that a miracle. State officials have pointed at bad weather as a possible factor. Strong wind gusts knocked the plane down. Images of the accident show the plane remained mostly intact. 
Investigators have recovered black boxes, recorders critical to understanding exactly what happened. Mexico's government established a commission to investigate, but have already acknowledged that it could take months before questions are answered. In the meantime, it is the voices of the survivors who are giving a better understanding. Ashley, who was there to celebrate a wedding. Al, to celebrate a baptism. Father Sanchez, his birthday. Now they all celebrate what they call a miracle. Leila Santiago, Mexico City. Wildfires surging across Northern California are forcing more evacuations. This morning, officials upgraded orders to get out to mandatory and tens of thousands of people are covered by the new advisories. More than 1,000 homes have been destroyed and another 12,000 structures are threatened. Experts are warning the breathability of the air is being severely impacted. A major clash over emissions for cars and trucks is taking shape tonight. The EPA wants to change the rules, and several state attorneys general don't, claiming the air will get dirtier and gas prices will go higher. Mary Maloney has the very latest. The U.S. Department of Transportation and the Environmental Protection Agency today proposed new rules to halt the tightening of standards regarding fuel efficiency and emissions for cars and trucks that will be built in the next few years. In a statement, Secretary of Transportation Elaine Chao said more realistic standards will promote a healthy economy by bringing newer, safer, cleaner and more fuel efficient vehicles to U.S. roads. The government argues that removing the burden on companies to adhere to stricter standards will make new cars more affordable. But a number of states across the country have said they are prepared to fight this change. The proposed rule from the federal government, if adopted, will, will make cars less fuel efficient and allow them to spew more harmful pollution. California's Attorney General Javier Becerra said that California has been a leader in pushing for cleaner vehicles and that changing this rule will cost American jobs. Clean standards for California at least mean new jobs and better ways. If we stop innovating on energy solutions, we'll find ourselves importing our competitors' technology and exporting American jobs. The government plans to hold three public hearings on this proposal in Washington, D.C., the Detroit, Michigan area, and in the Los Angeles area. Dates have yet to be announced. Mary Maloney, Currents News. President Trump has received a new letter from Kim Jong-un. Now the White House won't provide details on what the North Korean leader wrote, only saying it was received yesterday. Spokeswoman Sarah Sanders added the correspondence was aimed at following up on June's Singapore summit. This morning, the president tweeted his gratitude that Kim kept his word to return remains of Americans killed in the Korean War. Fifty-five flag-draped cases believed to contain the remains have returned to American soil, arriving in Hawaii last night. They were handed over last week on the 65th anniversary of the ceasefire that ended the Korean conflict. From this ceremony in Honolulu, the remains are set to undergo further analysis at a Defense Department lab to establish individual identifications. The Pentagon says the process could take years. Nearly 8,000 U.S. personnel are unaccounted for. Americans' belief in God is strong, but church attendance is less so. New findings out tonight show nearly 9 out of 10 Americans say they do believe in God, but only about 4 of them go to church regularly. According to Pew Research Center, many choose not to attend religious services because of practical or personal reasons and not because of lack of faith. Churchgoers told the researchers why they attend. 81% cite being closer to God. 69% want to give their children a strong moral foundation, and 68% hope to become a better person. For the first time in 50 years, the number of candidates to become permanent Catholic deacons is down slightly. The religious men work with priests and lay faithful to make the church stronger. Today, there are more than 18,000 deacons serving the U.S. church. There's a lot more news headed your way. Prosecutors investigating the Chilean sex abuse crisis want the Vatican to turn over files. The latest on that is next, and I'll discuss new developments in the Latin American country with Crux's senior correspondent. As the world meeting of families in Ireland draws closer, Dublin's archbishop is hoping the Pope holds a special session. 
And do you have a story idea? Something happening in your parish we should know about? Because we want to hear from you. Keep this email handy, newstips at desalesmedia.org. We'll be right back. Chile's top prosecutor wants the Vatican to turn over files on a group of 14 priests allegedly linked to clerical sex abuse. The case is notorious in Chile, and the band of priests has been labeled La Familia. The resignation of the bishop from the diocese where the clerics had been located was accepted by Pope Francis in June. No public response yet from the Vatican to the prosecutor's request. The sex abuse crisis crippling the church in Chile could be entering a new phase. The spotlight is now focused on two Chilean cardinals. Crux senior correspondent Elise Harris is exploring that story in depth. Yesterday, she joined me from Rome for an exclusive look at what she's found. Elise, thank you so much for being with us and helping us kind of unravel what's happening right now. Cardinal Francisco Erazuriz, he's a very close advisor to Pope Francis, and he's serving on the Holy Father's critically important Cardinals Council. You've uncovered information about him. Tell us more. So Cardinal Erazuriz, as you mentioned, is um, very close to the Pope. He's a member of the Pope's nine count council of cardinals. He has nine of cardinals from around the world who are advising him. And Cardinal Aratzeris is somebody he's known for a long time. They've mixed in the same circles in South America for years. And what's come to light now, you know, Cardinal Aratzeris has already faced charges of covering up sexual abuse um, of Father Fernando Caradima in Chile. Elise Erazuiz, he's one of the most senior prelates in Latin America, a longtime ally of the Holy Father, as you mentioned. Now, Francis has held McCarrick accountable, but what about the Chilean cardinal? Well, that's the big question here. You know, a lot of people are asking that. And I think after McCarrick, the next big spotlight is being shown on Chile right now. Clearly, it's been, we've all read about the scandals over the last few months, and it's very clear right now that. Cardinal Eratzeriz and the current Archbishop, Cardinal Dati, are right now facing tremendous pressure um, for what victims have said has been willful cover-up of abuse in the country, not just of Karadima, but of other cases as well that have come to light. And the big question right now is what Francis is going to do about it. You introduce another layer there, Ali. Santiago's Cardinal Ricardo Ezati. He will soon be questioned by Chile's top sex abuse prosecutor about the scandals. How is that investigation being viewed at the Vatican? I think right now everybody is a little bit rocked about what's going on. You know, it's um, in the U.S., in Chile, and kind of throughout the world, this crisis has affected not just Chile. And I think we've seen a lot of movements from the Holy Father in the last couple of months bringing prelates to account. In the, the resignations he's accepted in Chile, he's accepted the resignation of five bishops in Chile, and he just now accepted the resignation of McCarrick, as you mentioned, from the, the, the College of Cardinals. And so I think right now what everybody is doing is it's a watching and waiting game to see what the Pope is going to do, waiting to see what the result of that is going to be. And I think they're hoping, in a sense, that if there's dirt to be uncovered, that it will be uncovered and that the right actions will be taken. At least these crises run deep, as you have just outlined. You've just published the first installment of a three-part expose on the Crux website. Can you preview for us what else is ahead? Yes, yeah, so it's going to be two more parts. Um, so part one today explored Araxeris, kind of his, his own background and his rise to power in the Chilean church and how he became an influential contact and, and source for the Pope. Um, tomorrow is going to be part two, which explores just the relationship between Cardinal Aratzeriz and Luis Fernando Figari, this Peruvian layman who has been charged with abuse, and he is currently awaiting um, the result of a second appeal. Sanctions were put in place against him by the Vatican's Congregation for Institutes of Consecrated Life and Societies of Apostolic Life last year, and he appealed those sanctions, and they were rejected. He's waiting for a second appeal and we're waiting for the results of that to happen. And then part three is a wrap up to this series will come on Friday, looking at some of the big key takeaways from these crises in terms of what does this mean for the oversight of lay movements, not only priests and bishops, but how do we oversee communities like the ones founded by Figari? And what are some things we can take away from that in terms of best practices or you know, what to do mm -hmm. with some of these movements who have been, you know, 
whose founders have been accused of abuse going into the future. Elise Harris, I for one am looking forward to each of those reports. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Liz. It's a pleasure. When Pope Francis goes to Ireland for the World Meeting of Families at the end of this month, Irish clerical sex abuse is certain to be a major topic. While the Holy Father will be with thousands of young families to strengthen their faith, as he did four years ago in Philadelphia, Dublin's Archbishop Dermid Martin hopes Francis will also meet with abuse survivors during his two days in Ireland. The Archbishop says the Vatican has not yet confirmed that session will take place. Pope Francis showed his support for Yemeni refugees with a generous donation. Much of Yemen is in rubble from nonstop fighting between Houthi rebels and Saudi-led forces. Now, the Holy Father sent the funds to the refugees who are living in South Korea and urged them to be courageous. Still to come on Currents News, the TSA is considering an end to airport screenings at many airports. That story's next. And he is a fire chief and a grandpa. The story of his latest additions is a good one. We'll be right back. The TSA is considering a cutback on airport screenings. According to several reports, the agency might end the checks at more than 150 small and mid-sized airports across the country. The TSA reportedly believes it would be safe to ignore planes with 60 seats or less because they would not be big enough targets for terrorists. And then there were three. For weeks, a family in Gulf Shores, Alabama, joked about the possibility that two sisters would give birth on the same day. Well, it was a long shot, but it turns out the odds were definitely in their favor, and Grandma and Grandpa are just beaming. It was the best present anyone could have ever have given both of us. Gulf Shores Fire Chief Hartley Brokenshaw and his wife Suzanne have three new reasons to smile. I kept teasing my daughters. I said, now girls, now look, as it gets closer and y'all are going to the doctor on the same day, but different doctors, same office, you know, it would not hurt our feelings if we could just do this all at the same time. That wish came true last Friday while they were at the hospital for one daughter's birth. Their other one, carrying twins, went into labor too. I think they were as happy that it was happening as we were. I mean, they were tickled to death that they could, that it happened on the same day for both of them because they've really been close their entire lives. For Jill Prater, July 27th was just another day of the week. Now she and her sister will never forget it. And my sister and I were like FaceTiming, like she's in her recovery room and I'm about to go and like I'm in my labor and delivery room and we're FaceTiming back and forth. The nurses were just so excited that sisters were going to have babies on the same day. Two births, nine months in the making, bringing two sisters even closer together. To have them the same day, it's like it's crazy, but at the same time, it like it doesn't surprise me. Like that's just I, I feel like that's just how the whole thing went for us. Full of surprises, I guess. <laughs> and the surprises didn't stop there. One of the daughters was expecting two boys, but when she gave birth, one of the boys turned out to be a girl. So, of course, there were no complaints there from anyone. That is Currents News. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Liz Fawbliss. Please set your DVR to record this program so that you never miss it because we are putting your faith in the news. I hope to see you again next time.